All right, you can go ahead, Sheikh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala khatam al anbiya'i wal mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa ashabih. Wa tabi'ina wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin amma ba'd. Indeed, all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For he is the creator, the sustainer, and the controller of the universe and all within. And we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger, his family, his companions, and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time. And we pray that Allah the Exalted will bless us all to be among them. Respected sisters and brothers in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I trust that everyone is doing well, enjoying the nice weather. I apologize for the late start today, but alhamdulillah, we are here now and we are ready to continue. Now, last week we began talking about the collection of the Quran on the orders of the third uh, Khalifa, Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu anhu. May Allah be pleased with him. And alhamdulillah, we covered uh, some important issues uh, among them as to why he needed to do this. Um, we also talked about why is it he ordered once the copies were made and the collection was made that all other Quranic materials were ordered to be burned uh, or to be erased. We talked about why. Um, we also talked about the panel of people who were selected by the Khalifa Uthman to, to oversee this project. Uh, in fact, not just to oversee it, but to do it themselves. And Alhamdulillah, in this way, he was able to unite the Muslim world and to eradicate the differences that people had as it pertains to the various uh, qiraat or different recitations of the Quran. Today, inshallah, we will talk, we will continue to talk about the collection of the Quran because there are other issues that we have to deal with. And one of the major issues that we're going to deal with is um, the seven modes of recitation of the Quran. Um, now, last week I asked everyone if you had questions, uh, you know, you could send an email and then Brother Mahmoud would further that to me, the questions that is. Uh, that offer is always open and always on the table. So whenever or if ever you have questions, and you don't get the time to ask in class, then do not hold back and do not hesitate to send an email with your questions. And inshallah, um, the email or the questions will be forwarded to me so I can uh, answer those questions inshallah. All right, so here we go. Um, as of today, we will continue talking about the collection of the Qur'an at the time of, of Uthman ibn Affan. But our issue today we start with is the difference between the collections of Abu Bakr and Uthman. Each one collected the Qur'an, put it together. Um, but there are some differences. It's not just one duplicating the efforts of the other. So what exactly is different? Now... Remember, brothers and sisters, in the time of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, um, the motivation of collecting the Qur'an was due to the fear of losing parts of the Qur'an. How will they, how will they lose parts of the Qur'an? Because of the death of those who had memorized it. Because the people who had memorized the Qur'an were also the people who were not afraid to go out in jihad. Remember, those were the days when um, the Sahaba were taking the message of Allah to the lands around them. And inevitably, they were met with opposition. 
uh, 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 you know, all these rulers around Arabia did not want the message of Islam to come to the people, to their people, because of course they understood that if this message gets to the people, then the people will not be satisfied with the status quo. And so those with power, those who had wealth and authority in the land, did not want this message because this message would erode their authority and their status and their position in the land. So inevitably, they always sent armies to confront the Muslims. The Sahaba did not go out to conquer lands, brothers and sisters. They did not leave Medina to go out to conquer lands, to colonize the world, no. Britain and France and, 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 and these countries did that. And they're probably still doing it. Um, but the Muslims were simply taking this message to those who were around them. Because this is part of the mandate of the Prophet wasallam and those who follow him. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي Say this is my way, my mission, my job. Right? And this uh, uh, a verse is addressed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is, he, what is his job? أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ I invite to Allah. I have to take the message to those who don't have it. I have to invite them to Allah. أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي I and those who follow me. So based on this, the Sahaba knew that they also had the obligation of not just sitting with the message of Islam and be happy with it in Medina, but to now share this message with the other people around them. And so they went out of Medina in order to take the message. But like I said, the inevitably, the rulers of these other lands did not take it kindly to these uh, to the message being spread among their people. They opposed it. And this is how all these battles actually unfolded. We've talked a lot about a, a lot of about a lot of battles during the Khilafat of, of Abu Bakr. Well, not so many, but a lot during the Khilafat of Umar because his reign was long. All these battles were basically the result of the, the rulers and the leaders of these places trying to stop the message of Islam from getting to the people and the Muslims had no choice because you know either you turn back and you go home and you don't share the message or you have to confront the opposition and hopefully vanquish it. So in those days in the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq many of the Sahaba who had memorized the Quran were also in the army going out you know to, to, to carry the message and inevitably you had to, to fight to defend yourself and, and overcome the opposition. So in, in one particular battle, many the, the, the army suffered a high number of casualties. And that is when the, uh, uh, the companion Omar ibn Khattab suggested to Abu Bakr that they should collect the Quran in written form. Because he told Abu Bakr Siddiq, I'm afraid if casualties keep mounting like this in subsequent battles, I fear we may lose parts of the Quran because the people who have memorized it are being killed, are being martyred. And then eventually, when there are there is hardly any uh, one who has memorized the Quran left, and mostly the community is made up of people who haven't memorized the Quran, parts of the Quran could be lost. So he suggested that if we had it in written form, even if people are who have memorized it are killed, we have the written book, the written form, we can always learn from that, right? So this was the major objective or the major uh, 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 motivation in the time of Abu, Abu Bakr Siddiq in collecting the Quran. This rule does not apply or this ob objective does not apply to Uthman ibn Affan. There was no fear of losing the Quran. Mashallah, Islam had become established and it had spread far and wide and there were vast numbers of people who had memorized Quran and learned it. So there was no fear of losing parts of the Quran. Now, at the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq, the Quran was not collected in one place. As I've mentioned on a number of occasions, it was written down in the lifetime of the Prophet It just was not collected and put together in one place. 
You see, when the Prophet ﷺ used to call the scribes, as we're told in the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, and he would say to them, look, write these verses after those verses in such and such, a, such, and such a surah, the Prophet did not keep those written materials with him. The, the scribes would keep it with them. So the Quran was written down in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, all of it. But it was never collected and put together in one book form in one place. Right? So one scribe had some surahs that he had written for the Prophet ﷺ on the dictation of the Prophet ﷺ. Another scribe had some other surahs and so on. So each scribe would keep whatever he had written with himself. So this is the reality. It was written down, all of it. It just was not collected in one place in written form. Now, when Abu Bakr Siddiq collected the Quran, what he collected was that he put together these pages on which the Quran was written. But these pages were still, um, were still loose pages. He did not put any binding on them. And this is why his collection is called Suhuf. Suhuf meaning pages put together. Pages put together, but they're still loose in the sense that you can remove pages easily. You know, more or less like, you know, these uh, uh, binders we have these days, there's, there's kids in school have them like three whole binders where you put, you know, uh, many pages in one binder. Some of them, of course, are, th are thin, some are thicker and so on. The thing is you can open up that folder, right, that binder, and you can remove pages and you can rearrange the order of the pages and so on. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it was something like that during the Khilafat of Abu Bakr Siddiq. Just these loose pages put together. But he ensured, Abu Bakr ensured that each surah was in the order that they come in in the Mus'haf today. As the Prophet ﷺ had left them. Right? The the You, you see, when the Prophet ﷺ in his lifetime, the order of the verses in the surah were dictated by the Prophet ﷺ. Because he would tell the scribes, write these verses before or after such and such verses in, in such and such surah. Okay? Um, but the Prophet ﷺ never formally instructed the Sahaba, okay guys, write this surah before that surah. Of course, the companions knew the order of the surah based on hearing the Prophet ﷺ recite the Quran in salah. That's the, this is the major way that they learned the order of the surahs. So in the, time, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the verses in every surah were already put in order. In the lifetime of the Prophet, what, hap what did not happen was that the surahs were not organized in the order that they are in the Mus'haf today. When Abu Bakr collected it, he ordered Zayd to do that, to put them in the order, the written material in the order that they come in in the Mus'haf today. All right. Now, the collection of Uthman ibn Affan, the motivation for this was not fear of losing parts of the Quran, but it was to address the issue of the differences in the qiraat or the recitations of the Quran when the people recited in the, in the way that they learned from the companions who settled in their area. This was his problem or his issue, right? This was the motivation. How could he unite the Muslims and not have them differ and argue and fight over it, right? We, were told, we are told in the hadith that some were um, accusing others of kufr and all that because of the way that they were reciting the Quran. And remember, at that time, the people who recited differently, they learned Quran from Sahaba. So it's not that they were wrong. Is that that the other group never heard that way of reciting? So they thought that those guys were changing the Quran and tampering with the Quran. Right? And some were accusing others of making mistakes and so on. So Uthman was afraid of the danger of disunity among the Muslims about how to recite Quran. Not about whether it's Quran or not, it's how to recite it. So he ordered right a bunch of, of of companions four of them in particular to make copies of what abu Bakr did and he decided he will go a step further that he would not only put the surahs in the order that they come in 
but he will bind it so you cannot remove the pages, right? So that's why he 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 ordered them to copy the suhuf into mushaf. Basically, that's what it is. They made copies of the suhuf and then they 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 they, they, they binded it, right? They bounded it, so you couldn't remove the pages. He also. So that's one difference. He also, a second difference is, remember the issue for him was the differences in the Qira'at. So he told the four men he commissioned to do this collection and this verification and this copying is he ordered them if needed, if needed, because remember he ordered Zaid ibn Thabit, he's from the Ansar, from Medina. Then he ordered um, Abdullah ibn Zubair. He ordered uh, Abdurrahman ibn al-Harith. And he ordered Sa'id ibn Zaid. These three are from Mecca, from Quraysh, from the immigrants, the Muhajireen. He ordered these four to do the collection and the copying of the Quran from the suhuf that Abu Bakr had, had, had uh, compiled already. But he ordered the three, or he ordered the four, listen, if you guys differ about a particular word, how to recite it, should you say it like this or like that? Then he said, write it in the dialect of Quraysh. You know, let the, the, let the drawing of the word reflect the, the, the dialect of Quraysh. So limit it to that dialect of Quraysh in order to get rid of the differences uh, in the Qira'at of the Qur'an. But remember, he only told them, in case you differ with Zaid ibn Thabit about any dialect in the Qur'an, in case you differ. Now, he gave them the order, but there is no report that they ever differed on any word, subhanAllah. Okay? And of course, he justified this this uh, caveat per se that if you differ on any uh, uh, dialect in the Quran or any word how to say it, you should write it in the dialect of Quraysh. He justified it by saying, "Listen, the Quran was revealed initially in their dialect. Right? The first people to be addressed by the Quran were the people of Quraysh, and so the bulk of the Quran, brothers and sisters, actually was revealed in the language or the dialect of Quraysh." So he said, listen, if you guys are going to differ, then write it in the dialect of Quraysh because the, the, the vast majority of the Quran came down in their dialect. Now, although, although the Quran was revealed with other dialects in order to remove difficulty and hardships at the beginning, Uthman said, now at this point in time, we don't need that. See, initially when the Quran was revealed and the Arabs were coming into contact with the Quran, certain tribes found it a little bit difficult to recite because certain expressions or certain words they don't use in their dialect. They would use a different word. Okay? Or they'll say the word in a different way. All right? You know, forcing somebody to say vitamin when they're accustomed to saying vitamin is tough. Right? And that's why even in the English language we have different ways, um, different dialects if you like it, you know, sometimes you might call it accents when it comes to the pronunciation of certain words, right? Some people say vitamin, some say vitamin. Um, uh, some say tomato, some say tomato. All right. Um, what else? Multi and multi, anti and anti, right? Subhanallah. The point is, if somebody is accustomed to saying anti and you force them to say anti, then that's hard for them, right? So in the beginning, when the Quran was revealed, as 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 you know, the, the 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 Arab tribes were coming into contact with the Quran, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed the Quran in other dialects, in order to make the recitation of the Quran easy for people. Uthman ibn Affan decided, look, by the time he was Khalifa, there was no need for this anymore. Mashallah, revelation was complete. And it has been quite some years now that people have had uh, experience with revelation and reciting it and so on. So although the Quran was revealed with other dialects as well to remove difficulty and hardship, Uthman decided at, at this point in time, 
there was no need for that. So he said, listen, if you differ, write it in the dialect of Quraysh. If you don't differ, then no problem. You write it as you, uh, 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 as you believe that this is Quran, as it was revealed. Right? So he saw that need to keep the different dialects in order to make recitation easy, which happened at the beginning of Islam, or the first years of Islam, he saw that this no longer existed. This need no longer existed. So he thought, okay, you know what? This is a good way of getting rid of this fight and differences that people had in terms of how to recite the Quran. If we all had one standard, we khalas, we will not differ. Okay. So this was his um, his his issue, right? His dilemma, brothers and sisters, was how to preserve the unity of the Muslim Ummah so that they would not differ and fight about the dialects of the Qur'an. So he needed to ensure that whatever collection he did, it would result in unity rather, in, rather than creating this division and, and fight among people as to how you recite the Qur'an. This was his dilemma. And of course, the easiest solution to um, when it comes to a difference in dialect, is to write it in a in, in in a standard dialect. If you use a standard dialect, then you get rid of this dilemma of difference in dialect. All right, we can all say multi and multi, whichever it is. So if we choose one and we stick with it, Masha Allah, no problem. Now that is what the companions did. Right, they they wrote the Quran. As long as the four did not differ about any dialect, they agreed this is Quran. They wrote, they wrote it that way. But remember, Uthman told them, in case you differ, then you write it in the dialect of Quraysh. But what we have to bear in mind is there is no evidence, no reports that they ever differed and had to write the word in the dialect of Quraysh, subhanAllah. What is also important to understand is that Uthman did not order these four companions to write the Quran in a brand new standard dialect. No. He used the best and the most common dialect that the Quran was revealed in, and that is the dialect of Quraysh. As I said, the vast majority of the Quran was revealed in the dialect of Quraysh. In any case, brothers and sisters, remember, um, the dialect of the of the various other tribes are not so very different from the dialect of Quraysh that you needed like th that it was like a brand new language or a different language. No. Basically, Arabic language it was the same. But yes, certain tribes you know use certain words, uh, synonyms to convey a particular meaning, while another tribe might use a different uh, a different word. Uh, or a synonym, if you like, to convey the same meaning, right? So um, don't think that, oh, all these Arab dialects were like brand new languages. No. The bulk of all the Arabic dialects is the same, subhanAllah. Same words, same meanings, and everything. Just some words here and there were different, okay? And this is why, although the most common dialect was the dialect of Quraysh, the bulk of the dialect of Quraysh is common to all the Arab dialects. The, or the dialects of all the Arab tribes around, all right? Only some words here and there were, uh, were different. Right? And so this common dialect that the, 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 the majority of the Quran was revealing was the dialect of Quraysh. All right, the Quran was revealed to the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, and he is from Quraysh, all right? And the immediate people, whom the Quran addressed was, was Quraysh, subhanAllah. The people of the Prophet, his tribe, right? Banu Hashim and, and, and all the other uh, clans, per se, that make up Quraysh. Now, remember, Uthman also did not order that the entire Quran should be written in the dialect of Quraysh. That's not what he ordered. He ordered if there is any difference between the three men from Quraysh, and Zaid, who happens to be from Medina, if there is any difference in a particular word, 
then the order is only that one word should be in that one word in question should be written in the dialect of Quraysh. If they do not differ, then khalas, you keep it. So this is also an important point to, to bear in mind that he never ordered the entire Quran to be only in the dialect of Quraysh. No. Only if the three differed with Zaid, only then they are to write that one word in question in the dialect of Quraysh. And as I said, there is no report that the three men actually differed with Zaid, so they had to write that word in the dialect of Quraysh. The order was there, but it seems like it was never implemented. They had no need to implement it. All right, so there you go, right? There is no evidence that this difference happened between the four men, so they were forced to write a particular word in the dialect, dialect of Quraysh, right? So despite the order, these four companions who were commissioned to make copies of the Quran from Abu Bakr's copy, they had no reason to carry out the order. But the order was there in case that issue should arise. Alhamdulillah, it never came up. All right. Now, let's talk, brothers and sisters, about the seven modes of recitation. This is an issue, I must say, that has a tremendous amount of differences of opinion among the scholars. So if the scholars themselves could not agree on what exactly is the seven modes of recitation, then how about you and I, the ordinary people, subhanAllah? But let's talk a, a, about the seven modes of recitation, and inshallah, I will share with you um, you know, the major views of the scholars regarding what exactly, you know, is the seven modes of recitation and things like that. All right. So here we go. Al-Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, in his Sahih, uh, he has a chapter called, the chap chapter, the Quran was revealed in seven ways or modes, right? And the translator put in brackets to be recited. The Quran was revealed to be recited in seven ways or modes, ways or modes. This is the chapter that Al-Imam Bukhari has written in his Sahih, uh, chapter 6, uh, sorry, volume 6, chapter 5, page 481. And then he narrates this hadith from Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with both of them, that Allah's apostle, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, Jibreel recited the Quran to me in one way. I then requested him to read it in another way, a second way. And I continued asking him to increase the ways, and he kept on increasing me until he recited it in seven ways. Now, when the Prophet ﷺ said, if I back up a little bit, I requested him to read it in another way, and I continued asking him to increase, and he kept on increasing me, that is, Jibrail kept on increasing me. Do not understand from this, brothers and sisters, that Jibrail on his own was just reciting the Quran in different ways. No. What it really means is when the Prophet ﷺ asked him, you know, increase me, man. Uh, my people, you know, they, they all don't speak exactly the same. Some have different dialects. Jibreel alayhi salam went back to Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran in different dialects. So in a second one, then the Prophet asked for an increase. Jibreel went back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah revealed it in a third dialect and a fourth and a fifth until he recited it in seven ways. So please do not understand from this hadith that Jibreel, Allah, on his own was just coming up with these different ways of reciting the Quran. No. And this hadith, as you can see, is agreed upon. It was related by both Al Imam al Bukhari and Al Imam Muslim. And as you all may know, when a hadith is narrated by both of these two scholars, Al Bukhari and Muslim, this is the highest form of authentic hadith you can find. A hadith that is classified as agreed upon. All right. So the Prophet said that he recited Jibrail, recited the Quran to him in one way. He asked for a second and a third until seven ways, and it was granted to him. In other words, there are certain words in the Quran that are recited in the dialect of Quraysh and in the dialect of same uh, uh, different uh, uh, of different tribe and so on. Anyways, we'll talk about the details of what these seven modes 
of recitation really uh, mean? So what are these seven ways or seven modes? The term used in the hadith is ahruf. Now I know. Many of you know about qira'at of the Qur'an. Qira'at, brothers and sisters, is different from ahruf. They're not really the same. Qira'at might be the different ways of reciting in the same one way, same one mode, not seven modes. Okay? Understand that. So the seven modes, what are they? Now, here are the different views of the scholars. The first view is, and I think I have six or seven views, yes. I hope you don't become more confused at the end. The first view is that not every single word or every sentence is recited in seven ways. For example, if you take the first verse of Surah Al-Fatiha, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, in all the, 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 the recitations of the Quran, it's exactly the same. There is no difference. Because all, in all the dialects of the Arabs, the major dialects of that time, these were words that were very common and used a lot in their, in their dialects. All right? So uh, one view is when the Prophet says it was revealed in seven different modes or ways, ahruf, it's not that every single word or every single sentence was recited in seven ways. No. A lot of the Quran, brothers and sisters, in fact, the majority of the Quran is standard in all the dialects. It's the same words, no difference. Some words here and there, yes, right? Depending on the dialect, some words here and there would have been different. Okay, so that's the first thing to remember. Now, some scholars say, in, in, who hold this view, is that the maximum qira'at in any one word is seven. You cannot have more than seven, they say. And if anyone claims that some words are recited in more than seven ways, the answer is most of these extra ways beyond the seven are not authentic, or they may merely be a difference or a variation in the manner of reading and execution, in terms of mad and imala and so on. All right? So it's not really an extra way. For example, when some people recite this ayah, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, there is a mad on the ya. If you recite according to Hafs, and the vast majority of Muslims today recite according to the, the Kira'a of Hafs, we say, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, right? We stretch this, Ya, four counts. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Many of the other Kira'at, they say, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. They only stretch it two beats, that's it. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, and they go on. This here, brothers and sisters, this is not different dialects. This is simply a manner of execution. Whether you stretch or you don't, it's the same word. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. But do you stretch the ya into four beats or to just or, or keep it at two? It, it does not make it, make it a different word. It's the same word. Okay? So this is not dialect here. We're not talking, this is not different dialects. SubhanAllah. All right. Second view of the scholars, of some scholars, that is, that the number seven here mentioned in the hadith is not actually intended to be literally the number seven. It simply implies making it easy and simple. So when the Prophet ﷺ said, and I kept increasing him, and he kept increasing me until it ended up being seven ways, what he meant was, until it became easy and simple for the vast majority of people to recite. Right? So, according to this view, the number seven should not be taken literally. It should be understood metaphorically. That it was just increased to the point where, mashallah, the vast majority of the major tribes were now able to recite because uh, these words were in their um, uh, 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 dialect as well. Because, brothers and sisters, 
I mean, linguistically speaking, this, this, this view makes sense. It's rational. It's logical. The number seven in Arabic language is used to mean plenty in the unit range. Right? So if you're below 10, one to nine, seven is the, is the number that is used to mean a lot. 70 is used to mean plenty in the 10 range, right? 20, 30, 40, and so on. So when you're dealing with under 100, but more than 10, the number that shows a lot or plenty is 70. Now you might think, why not 80? Why not 90? Why not 60, right? But this is the Arabic language and the Arabic tradition. And 700 is used to mean plenty in the 100 range, which means it's not a specific number per se. All right, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ حَبَّةٍ أَنْبَتَتْ سَبْعَ سَنَابِلْ فِي كُلِّ سُنْبُلَةٍ مِئَةُ حَبَّةٍ Allah says the example of those who spend their wealth in the way of Allah is, is like that of a person who plants one grain. The grain grows, germinates and grows seven branches. And on each branch you have 100, uh, 100 grains. So from that one grain you plant, you reap 700 grains. Some scholars say here that the, the number 700 is really, in, it's indicative of a lot, not, not, not a specific number per se. Okay, that's the second view. The third view of what seven modes or ways of recitation means is the delivery of the meaning with a synonym even though it may be from the same language. Delivering the meaning with a synonym, even though it's all one language. And this, this view is actually based on this hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. And uh, this is a hadith in which once the Khalifa, well, he wasn't Khalifa at the time, but Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, during the lifetime of the Prophet alayhi salam, he happened to pass by another companion named Hisham ibn Hakim. And he heard him, Hisham ibn Hakim reciting the Quran, right? Hisham is praying, but he's reciting audibly, so Umar could hear. Or perhaps he was just sitting there reciting Quran, not in Salah necessarily. And when, actually, no, he was praying because in the hadith, yes, Omar said he wanted to grab him in his prayer, but he waited till he completed his prayer. So when Omar heard him reciting the Quran, you know, perhaps saying a different word than he had learned from the Prophet, salam, obviously he thought that Hisham was making a mistake. So as soon as Hisham finished his prayer, he grabbed him by the by his you know, collar here, his shirt, and he pulled him to the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, O Messenger of Allah, this man recited the Quran in a way that is different from the way you taught me. Now what's interesting, brothers and sisters, to remember is that both Umar ibn Khattab and Hisham ibn Hakim, these are two men who are from Quraysh. They are both from Quraysh, which means their dialect should be the same. And yet, Hisham is reciting in a way that was strange to Umar. That word or that statement, that, that sentence he said, that's not how Umar heard, learned from the Prophet ﷺ. So he told the Prophet, this man is reciting in a way different from the way you taught me. And he, by the way, he's still holding him by the neck, right? By, the, by his shirt, his gown. And the Prophet ﷺ said to Umar, let him go, release him. So Omar at that point let go of, of Hisham. And the Prophet salam, said to Hisham, okay, you recite, let me hear. What, what you were reciting earlier that, um, that was different from the way Omar heard, uh, learned, recite, let me hear. So Hisham recited. And Omar ibn Khattab said in the hadith, by Allah, he recited exactly as I heard him recited, reciting in his prayer. Like he didn't try to change it up, you know. Which means, you know, Hisham had nothing to fear. 
why would he fear anything? Look, this is how the Prophet ﷺ taught me. This is how I know to recite. I'm going to recite like this. So when Hisham recited and he was done, the Prophet ﷺ said, Hakada unzila. It was revealed like this. Meaning this is revelation from Allah. Then he said to Omar, you recite for me now. And Omar recited the same verses. As the Prophet ﷺ taught him, but of course, there were some differences now between the way Omar learned from the Prophet and Hisham learned from the Prophet. When Omar was done reciting, the Prophet said to him, or to the two of them, It was also revealed like this. It was also revealed like this. And then he told them, So recite what is easy from it, meaning what is easy for you to recite. But remember, from it means from what is revealed. So you're not going to make up your own synonym. No. Or even if there's a synonym found in Arabic language, if it is not authentic that it, that it was revealed like that, then you cannot use it. Only what is confirmed to be revelation you can use. So recite what is easy from it. Ah, Here is what Ibn Hajr said. From it, meaning from what was revealed. And Ibn Hajjah said that in this hadith, there's an indication that the number mentioned, seven, the intent of that is to make it easy on the reciter. So it's not so much the number that's important, but the fact that Right, it, the, 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 the ways were increased so that it, be, it would become easy on a person to recite. Because the Prophet ﷺ told them, so recite what is easy for you from it. Recite what is easy. So if you find this, this way is, is easier for you, recite it this way. As opposed to the other way. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, what is interesting in all of this is the language of Hisham and Omar is the dialect of Quraysh. Same language, same dialect. They're, they're both from Quraysh. They're both Qurayshi men. But the Qira'a was different. Because you see, the Prophet ﷺ taught Umar to recite in a way, you know, a word or two in whatever he recited was, was pronounced this way. And then, when he taught Hisham, same verses, a couple of words were not the same words that Omar learned. They were different words, although the meaning is the same. If I can give you a quick example, brothers and sisters, let me give you a quick example. Um, and just bear with me a moment. Let me bring up this uh, surah here. Verse 15. If you go to chapter 46, Surah al ahqaf chapter 46, write this down. Verse number 15. So chapter 46, verse number 15, 1, 5. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is how we recite according to Hafs. Ihsana. Ihsana. But if you listen to the recitation of Qaloon, the people from Libya and North Africa, they say, Now, Husn and Ihsan come from the same root. So the meaning is basically the same. But the, 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 the scale or the pattern of the words are different. Ihsan, you can hear the difference between Ihsan and Husn. Ihsana, Husna, although the root is the same, right? So I'm saying it probably was something like this, right? That, you know, let's say Omar learned Ihsana. 
Then he heard Hisham reciting Husna. He's like, hey, hold it there. The word supposed to be Ihsana. How come you're saying Husna? And I can tell you, brothers and sisters, when I first heard our Qari at the IIT reciting this ayah and saying Husna, I thought they were making mistakes the first time. So after the Salah, I had a chat with them. And that's when I learned that subhanallah in Qalun, in that version, that Qira'ah, the word is Husna, not Ihsan. Right? And the meaning is the same. Ihsan means to do good, to be kind, and husn means the same thing. All right? So this is what is interesting about this hadith of, of Umar and Hisham. They're both from Quraysh. Right? So it's not like one is from Quraysh, the other is from a different tribe. So yes, the dialect is different. No. Both from Quraysh. And yet, the Prophet ﷺ taught them this word. One of them, it's, you say it this way, and the other one, you say it that way. Because it was revealed like this. Ibn Abdul Bar, one of the great scholars of Islam, his name might not be familiar to you, but he's one of the great scholars of Islam. He said that most of the scholars are of the view that this is what this is the meaning of the seven modes of reciting the Quran, which is delivering the meaning with the synonym. Delivering the meaning with a synonym. Okay. And inshallah, we'll come across some more examples. All right. The fourth view among the scholars is the meaning of seven different modes is different languages or dialects. Different languages or dialects. Some scholars have rejected this because they say that in terms of the Arab dialects at that time, there are more than seven. It's not just seven, so why seven? But the answer to this objection is uh, the seven most eloquent of all the different dialects. Right? The Quran was revealed in seven modes or seven dialects, the most eloquent of them. So most of the Quran would be in the dialect of Quraysh. Some of it in the dialect of Hudayl. This is one of the major tribe at that time. Some in Hawazin, another major tribe at that time, and so on. Right? Now, first of all, it was first revealed to Quraysh and those who live near them. So it came down in the dialect that these people can understand. Quraysh and those who lived near them and around them. And then permission was granted to others to recite in their dialects this, this, despite the difference in the usage of words and grammar, as long as the meaning was the same. But again, I want to reiterate here, brothers and sisters, you're not going to use your own judgment here. It has to be confirmed that that way was also revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why we cannot just come to the Quran, you know Arabic language, you know a synonym for this word, so you substitute it. No. If it is not verified that this is revelation from Allah, you cannot recite it with the synonym. Yes. Subhanallah. Ah, and this is based on what is heard from the Prophet ﷺ, not desires. It has to be confirmed that it is revelation that the Quran was revealed like this. Also, in this view, do not understand that every word, it's not every word that's recited in seven different ways. Because like I said, in all these Arab, Arab dialects, the vast majority of the words are exactly the same. You know, if you take the British and the Americans, for example, North American English and British English. Yes, there are some pronunciations of some words that may be different between the British way and the North American way, right? Like vitamin and vitamin, multi and multi, anti and anti, right? Missile and missile, all right? But the vast majority of words in the English language is pron are pronounced exactly the same whether you are from North America or from Britain. So don't think that every single word is different. No, the vast majority of the words are all the same in all the dialects. But there are a few words here and there, yes, 
that Allah the Exalted reveal, send revelation to say, okay, you can say it this way and you can say it that way and that way and that way to make it easier now for all these tribes to recite. Right? So do not understand that every word is recited in seven different ways. No. Rather, the meaning is the seven ways or modes are dispersed throughout the Quran. So the bulk of it is Quraysh, but every now and then you might come across a, 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 a way of reciting that is from Hawaz, the dialect of the Hawazin tribe or the Khuza'a tribe and so on. Okay, it's dispersed throughout the Quran. Ibn Abdul Bar, I just told you about him, he objected though to this idea. He said, listen, there are very few words in the Quran that are recited in seven different ways. And here is an example. This word, Abad al-Tahut, right? In Hafs, we say Abad al-Tahut with Fatha on the Ain Ba and Dal. But it is also recited Abuda with Dhamma on the Ba. Notice Dhamma here, Abuda al-Tahut. It is also recited Abadu al-Tahut with the plural form. Abadu here is the plural form, right? With Dhamma on the Dal. You have Ubudu al-Tahut, right? Dhamma on the Ain and the Ba. You have Ubadu al-Tahut, right? Dhamma on the Ain, Shadda on the Ba with an Alif now. Abud, another way. Abadatu with the Tamarbuta. Abid, right? With the Alif and the Kasra on the on the Ba. Ubida, right? Dhamma on the Ain, Kasra on the Ba. Ibad, right? Kasra on the Ain, Fata on the Ba with the Alif but no Shadda. Look, Ubad and Ibad. Two words that mean the same thing, but they're pronounced differently, right? They're in different patterns. Ibn Qutayba, another scholar of Islam, he rejected this idea that even one single word in the Quran is recited in different, in seven different ways. He says, no, there isn't even a single word. Ibn, uh, uh, Ibn Abdul Bar said, very few, at least some, you know, there are a few though, very few, never, never mind. But Ibn Qutayba says there isn't even a single word in the Quran that's recited in seven ways. But of course, the scholars have rejected this. The scholar, a scholar named Ibn al-Ambari refuted this, giving examples like Abad al-Taghut, right? As I showed you just now, it's recited in, let's count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Ten different ways, not just seven, ten different ways. SubhanAllah. Okay. So Al Ambari, Ibn Ibn Al Ambari rejects, says, No, look, we have examples, man. You're saying not even a single word is recited in seven different ways. And I'm saying, or we're saying, no, there are a few examples, like Abad at Tawud and this word Uffin in the ayah, wala taqullahuma uff. This ayah. Let me give you the reference so you can check it up, insha'Allah. This is chapter 17, 1, 7. I want you to write it down. I should have included it here, actually. Chapter 17, and it's in verse 23. Chapter 17, verse 23. Here Allah talks about parents and the status of parents. And Allah says... And your Lord has decreed that you worship none but him and that you be kind to your parents. If one of them or both of them were ever to attain old age while you are alive, do not say oof to, uh, to, to, to them. Right? The word oof. The word oof in Arabic language is a verbal expression of displeasure. And it is considered the least verbal displeasure you can show to someone by saying, oof. All right. Now look at the different ways this word has been recited in the Quran. According to Hafs, the way most of us recite, we say, wala taqullahuma uffin, with tanwin kasra on the fa and a dhamma on the alif, uffin. 
But we also, it has also been recited uffi without the tanween, uffa with fatha, uffu with dhamma, uffin, like we recite with tanween kasra, uffun with tanween dhamma, uffan with tanween fatha, uffi, sorry, iffi, kasra on the alif and kasra on the fa. We say uffi, this is iffi. We have iffa, and we have uffu, and we have uffa. And uffata. Yep. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven ways this word is recited. All right. And remember, Allah Ibn al Ambari is are using these is using these examples to reject the claim of Qutaybah that, that there isn't even a single word in the Quran recited in seven ways. And he's given three examples of three words in the Quran that are recited in seven or even more ways. Take, for example, the word Jibreel. Yes, the angel Jibreel, right? Angel Gabriel, mashallah. There is Jibreel. You can say Jibra'il, 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 with, with Shadda on the lamb and no alif. You have Jibreel, right, with with uh, with, with uh, 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 a yeah. After the uh, Jabril, sorry, Jabril. We have Jibril and Jabril. We have Jabrail. Jabrail and Jabrail. Right? There is a Ya here after the Hamza. In Jabrail, there is no Ya. We have Jabrail. Right? Jabrail. This one here over here where my cursor is Jabrail. This is Jabrail. You have. Jibril, which and you have Jib Jibrilu and Jibrilun, right? With tanween and without tanween. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different ways the word Jibril is, is recited. Right? Most of us either know Jibril or Jibrail, right? This one here. Oh, sorry, where, where are you? Oh, let's go back. Yeah. Jibrail. Many of us know Jibrail, and many of us know Jibril. These two are, are, are very common. But the others might not be so common, but they're also valid ways the word Jibril or Jibrail has been pronounced in the Quran. Jabrail, Jabrail, Jabril, and Jabrail. And Jibrilun with Tanween. Okay. So Alhamdulillah, there are examples of words in the Quran that are recited in seven different ways. One word. Now, some scholars reject the idea that seven modes mean seven dialects. They say, look, seven ways or seven modes basically mean the same meaning conveyed using different words, meaning synonyms. Not seven dialects, but simply synonyms for certain words. For example, the word uh, that means to come. If you're learning a little bit of Arabic language, you know ta'ala means come. But some Arab tribes say halum means to come. And aqbil also means to come. In fact, this word halum, my brothers and sisters, was used in the Quran in Surah Al Ahzab and has recited it like this halum. All right, and I can give you the reference for this ayah as well. You can check it out. Let's go to chapter 33. Chapter 33. Verse 18, verse 18. Chapter 33, verse 18. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah, قَدْ يَعْلَمُ اللَّهُ الْمُعَوِّقِينَ مِنْكُمْ وَالْقَائِلِينَ لِإِخْوَانِهِمْ هَلُمَّ إِلَيْنَا Allah does know the ones from among you who prevent others from joining the battle and those who say to their brothers, come along with us. هَلُمَّ إِلَيْنَا Come with us. 
So haluma means come, ta'ala. Right? The most common word most people know is ta'ala. Very few people use haluma. Mind you, those who know Arabic language, when you read this ayah and you read haluma, you know what it means. And yet, when you speak, most likely you will say ta'ala. Come, come with me. Ta'ala ma'i. Come with me. You will not say halumma ma'i. So some scholars say, listen, it's not seven dialects. It's just that synonyms that are used with the same meaning. Right? So different words conveying the same meaning. Right? So you're using synonyms. Ta'ala was used also in the Quran to mean come, right? And you have aqbil. So this is another view among the scholars. And some scholars say, well, it's also possible that these different words, these synonyms have the same meaning, but they're limited to seven dialects, right? To seven major dialects at the time. All right. Another view, number five. These scholars say, that seven modes or seven ways mean the ways in which difference or variation can occur in a word. And there are seven different ways in which variation can occur in a word. Number one, changes in vowel signs without change to its meaning or drawing. The vowel sign change, but the meaning or the drawing of the word does not change, it stays the same. For example, this ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah 282, وَلَا يُدَارَّ It is also recited, وَلَا يُدَارُ كَاتِبٌ وَلَا شَهِيد. Notice, in the red, the ra has fatha, yudara, and with the blue, the ra has dhamma, fatha and dhamma. So this is a change in vowel sign, but there is no change to the meaning or the drawing of the word. If I remove all these vowel signs, brothers and sisters, the drawing of the of the of these two words is exactly the same. We have a ya, then a dad, then an alif, then a ra. So this is one. This is this is this views uh, uh, idea that the seven modes mean. You know, it refers to the seven different ways in which a variation can occur in a word. One is that it can change its vowel signs, but it does not change the meaning or the drawing. The meaning is still the same. Subhanallah. Allah says here in this ayah, this uh, uh, this is the ayah about writing down your, your financial agreements, right? When you take a loan, Allah says write it down. Write down the terms of the loan. How much you're taking, when to pay back. Um, how much you're paying back and things like that, right? Allah says in this statement, and neither the writer nor the witness should be harmed. The one who writes this agreement and the one who witnesses it, they should not be harmed. Right? So this is the meaning, is exactly the same. All right. Number two, remember, there are seven different ways that variations can occur. One is um, change in vowel sign while the drawing of the word stays the same and the meaning is the same. The second way with, in which a change, a, a, a variation can occur is that which changes due to the change of a, a verb, like in this ayah, فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا بَاعِدْ بَيْنَ أَسْفَارِنَا It is also recited, فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا now, what's interesting is Ba'uda and Ba'id, both words come from the same root. Ba'ada meaning to be far. Ba'id, however, is used in the imperative form, while Ba'uda is, is the past tense form of the verb. Okay, so this is a change of verb. And this is chapter. Um, uh, uh, Surah Saba, chapter uh, verse 19. It is also recited, فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا بَعَدَ بَيْنَ أَسْفَارِينَ Right? Notice, بَعَدَ Shadda on the Ayn and Fatha on all three letters. It is also recited, فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا بَعَدَ بَيْنَ أَسْفَارِينَ بَعِدْ بَعَدَ Four different ways. And all these four 
our revelation because the Prophet ﷺ recited it like this. Number three, in terms of the seven ways in which variations can occur. And remember, variations, the seven variations, these scholars say this is what seven modes mean. This is what it refers to. That which changes due to the presence or absence of dots on some letters. Like this ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah 259, right? And I've given you the references here. I want you to check it out, brothers and sisters. كَيْفَ نَنْشُرُهَا and كَيْفَ نُنْشِزُهَا right. Number three, that which changes due to the presence or absence of dots of some letters. كَيْفَ نَنْشُرُهَا كَيْفَ نُنْشِزُهَا Now here's the thing. If you take away all these dots on the noon, the noon and the sheen, the noon, the noon and the sheen and the sign, the drawing of the word is exactly the same. Now remember, brothers and sisters, in the time of the Prophet, ﷺ, there were no dots on the letters. Forget about vowel signs, Fatah and Dhamma and Kasa. There were no dots on the, on, the, on the letters. So if you remove these dots, on these letters here, the noon, the noon, the sheen, and the zayn, and over here, what happens? The drawing of the word is exactly the same. And depending on the dots you put in and where, the word is either nanshuru or nunshizu. Interestingly, the mean is still the same. The meaning is still the same. So the physical sound of the word changes. But the meaning is the same. Nanshuru is different from Nunshizu. You can hear the difference. But the meaning is still the same. Right? And you can check it out. I can tell you, according to Hafs, we recite Kaifa Nunshizuha with design. Kaifa Nunshizuha, not Nanshuruha. Now, the point is, Nanshuru is also revelation. It was recited like that by the Prophet. Number four, that which changes due to the exchange of one letter. For another letter that is close in makhraj. Right? Two letters are close in the way in, in where you pronounce them or how you pronounce them. So you, 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 you can switch them. For example, وَطَلْحِنْ mandud. This in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, verse 29. According to Hafs, we recite وَطَلْحِنْ with ha mandud. But there is a recitation وَطَلْعِنْ mandud with ayn. Right? I've put the two letters in, in red. So one recitation uses the ha, the other ayn. Meaning is the same, but the letter is different. Why? Because these two letters, ha and ayn, are pretty close in their makhraj, uh, how the place of the throat and the mouth where you pronounce them. And I know, right, this this whole uh, concept of makharij, right? The, 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 the origin, the place of origin of the letters in the throat and the mouth, it's actually a, a science by itself. Number five. Right. Remember, we're talking about this view that says the seven modes mean the seven different ways that variation can occur. Number five is of the seven ways in which variations can occur is that which changes due to mixing up the order of the words. For example, وَجَاءَتْ سَكْرَةُ الْمَوْتِ بِالْحَقِّ It is also recited وَجَاءَتْ سَكْرَةُ الْحَقِّ بِالْمَوْتِ See that? The two words, mouth and haq, were switched around here. And, and this ayah is in Surah Qaf, chapter 19. Uh, sorry, verse 19. Surah Qaf, which is, I believe, Surah 50, chap, uh, verse 19. According to Hafs, we recite, But in other recitations, it switched around. Now, number six. That which changes due to addition or deletion. You add or you take away. For example, according to Hafs, when we recite this surah, Surah Al-Layl, Wal-Layli Ida Yagsha, verses 1 to 3, in particular verse number 3, we say, Wal-Layli Ida Yagsha, Wal-Nahari Ida Tajalla, Wa Ma Khalaqa Dhakara Wal-Untha. Remember, we're dealing with addition or deletion. Now check out this other qira'ah. 
والليل إذا يغشى والنهار إذا تجلى والذكر والأنثى ما خلق is deleted it is not here so this is a change due to addition or deletion right you've deleted ما خلق والذكر والأنثى and Ibn Abbas used to recite والذكر والأنثى as is mentioned by Ibn Kathir if you go to the tafsir of the surah in the Quran all right and number seven that which changes by exchanging one word for another word with the same meaning like this in in, in in some of the companions used to recite kasufil manfush right ehin we all recite with the word ehin and uh, 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 and ehin means uh you know cotton you know cotton wool as we call it yeah suf is the same thing it's wool cotton wool kasufil manfush like fluffed up um right allah says and the mountains will be like these fluffed up uh, cotton wool like if you take a piece of cotton wool and you pull it, you don't, you don't, you don't pull it. You, you just fluff it up a bit, right? A little tiny piece can expand and get light and, and huge, right? So the mountains that are solid rock, huge solid chunks of rocks, Subhanallah, will be like this carded wool, right? This fluffed up wool floating about, light. Subhanallah, this is one of the terrifying scenes of the day of judgment. All right. So here you're changing one word for another. So these scholars say seven modes of recitation. This is what it means. It doesn't have to do. It has nothing to do with dialect or whatever. It's just that these are the seven different ways in which variation can occur. You change one word for another word, or you delete some words, right? Ma'khalaq and things like that. Okay. Now this view was rejected by many scholars because they say that in these kiraat. Most of the people at that time could not read or write. And you notice, you need to know, you need to be able to read and write to understand some of these things, right? You need to be able to read and write. So if the people, if the people were, uh, you know, could not read and write, how could they know the difference between Nanshur and Nunshur, right? Now, all right. The sixth opinion among the scholars is that they say, the seven ways, seven ways or modes mentioned in the hadith, they say that speech is limited to seven areas of differences. And this is what the seven modes refer to. The seven areas of differences in speech. First of all, there's a difference of nouns being plural, singular, or dual, or masculine or feminine. For example... In chapter 66, verse 12, this is Surah uh, At-Tahrim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَرْيَمَ بَنَةَ عِمْرَانَ الَّتِي أَحْصَنَتْ فَرْجَهَا فَنَفَخْنَا فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِنَا وَصَدَّقَتْ بِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّهَا وَكُتُبِهِ وَكَانَتْ مِنَ الْقَانِتِينَ In Hafs, we recite وَكُتُبِهِ Kutub is the plural of kitab, meaning books. In Qalun, if you go to the IT for Salah and our Qadis recite this ayah, they say, وَكِتَابِهِ وَصَدَّقَتْ بِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّهَا وَكِتَابِهِ وَكَانَتْ مِنَ الْقَانِتِينَ So here, kitabihi is a valid recitation because it is, it is authenticated that the Prophet ﷺ recited it like this. So this is the, one of the seven areas of differences in speech. You can use plural or singular, right? Meaning is the same. His books or his book is the same thing, right? Because when the singular is used, it, it's like, a, it's like a, a collective noun that refers to all the revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like the word insan. Human being doesn't mean one single individual. It means all of mankind, right? Now, number two, the difference in conjugation of verbs, past tense, present tense, and command forms. All right, and we mentioned this already in a different view. فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا بَاعِدْ بَيْنَ أَسْفَارِنَا Another way to recite is فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا بَاعَدَ بَيْنَ أَسْفَارِنَا فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا بَاعَدَ بَيْنَ أَسْفَارِنَا فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا بَعُدَ بَيْنَ أَسْفَارِنَا Surah Saba, verse 19. So this is a difference in speech 
an area of difference is how you conjugate the verb, whether you use past tense, present tense, and command form, right? Ba'id is the imperative form or command form. Ba'ada, Ba'ada, and Ba'uda, these four, these three, sorry, are the, the past tense form, yet they are on different patterns. Number three, the variation of case endings. All right, and this one was mentioned before. Wala yudara, wala yudaru, right? Case endings here, the Dhamma is different on the Fatha here, right? This is called case ending, where the vowel sign on the last letter is different. The meaning is still the same. Number four, addition and deletion, right? In Surah at tawbah verse 100, we recite Tajri min tahtiha al-anhar, but there are some qira'at where you recite Tajri tahtaha al-anhar. There is no min. The min is deleted. Number five, mixing up the order of words. We talked about this one. Waja'at sakratul haqqi bil maut. Waja'at sakratul haqqi bil maut. Sakratul mauti bil haqq, sakratul haqqi bil maut, right? Maut and haqq are, 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 are mixed up. Number six, exchanging of one word for another, right? So basically using, as we say, a synonym. This one is mentioned in the view before. It is also recited as kasufil manfush, right? So you're changing one word for another. Vowel signs and so on are the same. Well, it's a different word. So, but the last vowel sign is the same. And number seven, the difference of dialects in terms of ibala and tafkhim and idgham, that is how you actually pronounce certain words. For example, in this surah, one najmi ida hawa. Surah al Najm, the last word in this first ayah, Hawa, Hawa, is also pronounced Hawe and Hawe, Hawe and Hawe, Hawa, We, and We. Can you hear the difference? Hawa, Hawe, Hawe. We and We are two, uh, uh, they sound similar, but they're different. One Najmi either Hawa, that one is easy and clear. That's how we recite, by the way, according to Habs. One najmi ida hawe, one najmi ida hawe, where, where, and we, right? Different, right? Similar to vitamin and vitamin, all right? And multi and multi and and uh, and um, tomato and tomato, right? Subhanallah, hawa, hawe, hawe, subhanallah, right? So, this is what number seven is all about here difference in, in terms of how you actually say the word, your accent per se. Same word, by the way, it's the same word. Hawa or Hawi is the same word. Written exactly the same. It doesn't change. Meaning doesn't change. Right? Uh, Ibn Hajr says that the view number six is more or less a cleaned up version of view number five. So number, num the, 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 the number five view and number six view are basically the same. Number six is better in the sense that it's more, it's more of a cleaned up version of number five. And the seventh view among the scholars as to what exactly the seven modes or ways mean, they say it means seven types of expressions. So when the Prophet says that the Quran was revealed in seven different modes, what he means is that there are seven different types of expressions and the Quran encompasses all these seven different types of expressions. The first is Zajir, warning. Number two, Amir, commanding, right? Warning. There are verses that warn people. Amir, meaning issuing commands. There are verses. Aqimu Salah is, 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 is a command, right? Um, you know, warning. Wallahum adabun shadid. For them is a severe punishment. That's a warning. Number three, halal. There are verses that say things are halal. There are verses, number four, that say things are haram. Muhkam, verses that are clear, no ambiguity. Number six, mutashabi allegorical right and number seven number seven amthal or parables so this view is this is what seven modes mean it means the seven types of expressions when you in speech and the quran has covered all seven types so there are verses that use amthal allah says watilkal amthal right Allah says the parable or the example of those who were given the Torah to carry as revelation. And then they did not carry it. They did not fulfill it. They did not obey its commands. They are like donkeys carrying 
or it carry they're like a donkey carrying a load of books the donkey has the knowledge on its back in the books but it has no clue what what, what knowledge is there subhanallah right so that's that's amfal you have mutashabi allah mentions this in surah at the beginning of surah ali imran minhu ayatun muhkamatun hunna ummul kitab wa ukhara mutashabihat allegorical allah says that it is he who revealed the quran from it are verses that are muhkam clear to the point no ambiguity hunna ummul kitab and these clear and unambiguous words and non-metaphorical words or statements they form the um the the, the, the bulk of the quran but there are a few that but there are some that are allegorical okay but this view is rejected because the scholars say listen one word if it can be recited somewhere between one to seven different ways cannot apply to halal and haram because something cannot be halal and haram at the same time so it does not apply here so uh these are the views among the scholars as to what exactly seven modes mean and as you can see brothers and sisters if the scholars have differed what about you and I? So there is actually uh, no clear opinion as to what exactly the seven modes of, the, of the recitation mean. Okay. The big question, though, is, and ho hopefully when we deal with this issue, um, you know, this might shed more light on exactly what seven modes mean. Are the seven modes or ways of reciting the Quran still present today? The Prophet ﷺ said that when he asked Jibra'il for an increase in ways or modes or ahruf, he kept on increasing him from Allah until it was revealed in seven modes. Are these seven modes still present today? Very, very pertinent question and important question. Now, the scholars have differed. They differed about what exactly the seven modes mean. And they also differ about whether the seven modes are present in the Quran today and pe whether people recite in all seven modes of the day. Ibn Hajar said, the correct view and the correct opinion is that the Mus'haf of today, this is the Mus'haf that is based on the copies that Uthman radiallahu anhu made. And by the way, brothers and sisters, the Quran that we have, or the Mus'haf that we have today, is called the, the Uthmani Mus'haf. Uthmani Mus'haf. Why Uthmani? Because it attributes it back to the Khalifa Uthman. Because remember, he ordered that all the other copies that the companions had made, their personal copies, he ordered them, burn those, destroy those. Now, if you want a copy of the Quran, no problem, come. Take our copy and make a copy and go. So all the Qur'ans, the correct terminology is Mus'haf, by the way, not Qur'an. The Qur'an is what is the words of Allah in, the, in those books. But the pages themselves and the color of the ink and so on, these are not revelation from Allah. So it's incorrect. All right, it's incorrect. Let me uh, look around here. I should have a Mus'haf somewhere. Yeah. This, brothers and sisters, is, we call it Qur'an, right? But actually, the correct term terminology is Mus'haf, which means pages that are bounded together, right? Now, this cover, Allah did not send down this. This page, right, the page was not sent down by Allah. The color of the ink did not come down from Allah. But the words written here, these words, those words are the Qur'an. So this physical book is called Mus'haf. This is the correct terminology. And by the way, see this Mus'haf here? It says here, Mus'haf Libya. Biriwayat al-Imam Qalun. 
liqira'atil imam nafi' so this mushaf is according to the qira'ah of qalun which is recited and prevalent in libya now if you were to take this and take another mushaf that is based on the version the, the qira'ah of hafs and you compare you will find many many differences in hafs often we say wa annahu in qalun they say wa innahu inna anna right difference of a fatah on an alif and things like that all right so the correct terminology is mushaf so you can say to somebody pass me the mushaf please it is actually incorrect to say pass me the quran you cannot pass the quran because the quran that allah revealed is not tangible it's not physical it's the words that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed so you can say, I can recite Quran, Allah says in the Quran, but you should not say, pass me the Quran. You say, pass me the Mus'haf. So Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, he says that the correct view is that the Mus'haf of today, all of them, they're all called the Uthmani Mus'haf. Because they're all, even these, even this one from Libya, that is based on the Qira of Qalun, it is still called an Uthmani Mus'haf, because it's still it's it's still based on that uh, copy or the copies that Uthman commissioned when he was the Khalifa. So the Mus'haf of today is what has been agreed upon by the companions, and we are certain that this is what was revealed and written on the orders of the Prophet wasalam, and that they contain some of the seven modes, not all of them. They contain some of the seven modes of recitation, not all of them. This Ibn Hajar says is the correct opinion. Right. Two things, or a couple of things. Number one, it is agreed upon by the Sahaba, and therefore we are certain that this, the Mus'haf we have today, this is what was revealed and was written on the orders of the Prophet ﷺ. And that it contains only some of the seven modes, not all, uh, not all seven. And he gave some examples. In the Meccan Mus'haf, right, the Mus'haf that was sent to Mecca, the verse Tajri min Tahtiha al Anhar at the end of Surah Al Tawbah, right, chapter nine, verse one hundred. The min is present. Tajri min Tahtiha al Anhar. But in other Mus'haf, it is without the min. Tajri tahtaha al-anhar. Meaning is the same, by the way. The meaning is the same. It does not affect the meaning. And he went on to say, like the differences between the Masaif of the different cities, where a number of wows are present in some and absent in others. A number of wows are present in some, absent in others. Remember, when the four companions made copies, they didn't just do away with all the dialect and all the seven ways and just write it one standard way. Once it was verified and proven that this is the way that it was recited, khalas, and they did not differ, they wrote the mushaf in such a way that it, 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 uh, it accommodates different pronunciations and things like that. Like the word nanshur and nunches. The drawing is the same. It, you know, ya'malun and ta'amalun, yes? Naz, uh, 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 uh. Nunazil and Nunzil, right? The drawing of the word accommodates the, the, the different pronunciations. All right, the number of Ha and Lam and so on in, in, in some Mus'haf. Lam and Ha are present in some uh, 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 and are not present in others. And it's based on the fact that it was revealed in both ways, with or without this Ha and the, or the Lam or the Wow. And so what most likely happened, Ibn Hajjah said, is that the Prophet salam, ordered two persons to write it. So one person wrote with the with the wow, and then when it was revealed without the wow, he told another person to write it, not the same writer. And so one wrote this way, one wrote the other way. But the point is, both are from the Prophet salam. Or it could mean he told one person to write it in the both ways. With and without the, the wow or the lamb or the ha, and so on. 
again, the bottom line is both ways are coming from the Prophet ﷺ. So it's very important to understand that even, even though some scholars say, oh, you know, one meaning of the seven modes, it's synonyms used for certain words. Ah, it's not based on what we feel. It's based on did the prophet say that you that it, it can be recited like this? Did he recite it like this? Did he use this synonym here? Yes or no? Because not everywhere we come across Ta'ala in the Quran, we can substitute it for Haluma. Or wherever we see Haluma, we can substitute it for Ta'ala. No. It has to be authentic. That the Prophet Sallam, in this particular ayah, he recited it with this word or with the, or, or this synonym or that synonym. So in the end, it all comes down to it, it can it be verified that the Prophet Sallam, recited it like this? Yes or no? Everything else of the different Qira'at that does not agree with the drawing or the rasm of the Mus'haf. It is permissible to recite in, in order to make it easy. But the situation changed in the time of Uthman. And when some others accuse others of kufr, the Sahaba decided to limit the recitation to one mode or one way, for which permission was given for it to be written and abandon the rest. So originally, before Uthman did what he did, Masha Allah, all right? Uh, you know, this is why companions had their personal mushaf. The Prophet taught them how to, 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 to recite, so they wrote it that way. Another companion, same surah, he was taught differently by the Prophet, so he wrote it that way. This is what Uthman told them, burn all these copies. Because later on, the next generation, when they find these two copies, and they say, hey, hold it. How come we say here, وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنثَى but this guy says, There is no ma'khalaq. What's going on, right? People will not know the difference. They will not understand what's going on. So, when in the time of Uthman, when the situation changed, and these kira'at, and these different ways of reciting became a problem for people, uh, or they were using it to divide themselves, the companions decided, you know what? Let's limit it to one way that is permissible to be recited, Let's do away with the rest. So this way, nobody will differ. We're all reciting in the same way. What is here to argue about? And this one way, khalas, it is authentic that the Prophet ﷺ recited it in this way. So this is what they did. Um, Abu al-Abbas said, the most correct view among the skilled scholars is whatever is recited these days, are some of the seven modes which were permitted, not all of them, right? And this actually corroborates what we just said. What regulates this? Like, like what decides whether it's a, what's allowed, what's not allowed? How do we decide? Well, it has to conform with the drawing of the words of the Mus'haf. Remember, the way the Mus'haf is written, if you take out all the vowel signs and all the dots, the drawing of the of whatever is left there can accommodate certain pronunciations. That's what this means. All right. For example, in that ayah in Surah uh, Tahrim, the last ayah, right? Wa kutubihi, wa kitabihi. If you take away all the vowel signs and all the dots, then the drawing in the Mus'haf accommodates kutub and kitab. So subhanAllah, when, when the Sahaba did this copy in the time of Uthman, they were very smart. They also ensured that the way they, they wrote the words, because remember, they didn't have dots and so on, right? They wrote it in a way that accommodates some of these different qira'at and different modes of recitation. So this is what regulates it. A person cannot come and say, hey, I can recite this word like this. Unless... The drawing of that word, the rasm it's called, in the Mus'haf accommodates that. Even though linguistically it's a, it's a, it's a synonym, it means the same thing. For example, let me give you a quick example. I know, this is confusing. Take the first ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. The word hamd, another Arabic, a synonym for it in Arabic is afana. Afana'u lillahi Rabbil Alameen. Here is the problem. I cannot come and say to anybody, hey, you know what? 
I can recite this surah, this ayah, and replace alhamdu with athana'u because the meaning is the same. It's a synonym. Why can why am I not allowed to do this? Because if you look at the drawing of the word thana, or sorry, if you look at the drawing of the word alhamdu, just take away all the vowel signs and so on, and just leave the letters alone, it will not accommodate the word thana because thana is a completely different word with completely different letters. Alhamdu has alif and lam, athana has alif and lam, so that's okay. But hamd is ha mim dal, and thana is tha nun alif hamza. Right? Notice the words, the, the letters themselves are very different. But ba'id and ba'uda and ba'ada, right? If you look at ba'uda and ba'ada, the drawing of the word is exactly the same. Ba'ain dal. Ha mim dal, hamd. Thana is tha nun hamza. Completely different letters. So if my synonym does not conform with the drawing of, uh, of the word in the Mus'haf, then it is not acceptable to recite the Qur'an like that. Only if it conforms. This is what regulates. This is what tells you, yes, this is a, an acceptable way of reciting the Qur'an. If it's not in conformity, some scholars say, it might be permitted, but it was discarded, but it is discarded if the isna if the isnad to it is authentic. Because if the isnad is sahih, it is not authentic to prove that it is Quran. Because it is possible a lot of it was explanation that was written with the Quran, right? The Sahaba wrote their that the tafsir in the margins, or they wrote it above or below the word. So the isnad. If it is sahih, that's not enough to prove that it is authentic. Right? We need proof that this the Prophet recited it like this. Only then we can say, okay, this is permissible. Okay, let's stop here, brothers and sisters, because I have the questions I would like to um I would like to do with you. Let me just make a note of where we stop today. So that I know where to continue from next next week. All right. So um, you all have a lot to to to, to digest, right? This week's uh, today's today's lesson is uh, needs to be digested. So I would suggest you, inshallah, go it over from the handout, and um, inshallah, it will become clear. Yes, take your time when you go it over. All right. So here are the questions. If you have any questions yourselves, as is customary, you can type it in the chat and, and inshallah, um, <clears throat> we can answer it. Okay, so the first question is, when was the entire Quran put into written form? When was it written down? A, during the Khilaf of Abu Bakr Siddiq. B, during the Khilaf of Uthman ibn Affan. C, during the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And D, none of the above. When was the entire Quran written down or put into written form? All right. So uh, you can go in the chat and you can type the answer. Put the number of the question, 1A or 1D or 1C or whatever you think is the, uh, is the correct answer. And yes, this is a very difficult topic, brothers and sisters. That's why I'm saying, inshallah, um, over the course of the next week, reread the handout, read each point and, and think about it a little bit. Some of them are similar, some are different. It's It can be quite confusing. Yes, when was the entire Quran put into writing? When was it written down? A, was it during the Khilaf of Abu Bakr Siddiq? B, during the Khilaf of Uthman ibn Affan? C, during the lifetime of the Prophet alayhi salam? Or D, none of the above? What is the correct answer? Type your answer in the in the chat. Yes. I'm gonna give you a couple of seconds. No takers. Question number one. What's the correct answer? One B. All right. During the Khilafat of Uthman ibn Affan. One A. During the Khilafat of Abu Bakr Siddiq. Very good. 
Um, any other any other choices? I'm gonna give you all a few more seconds. We have a, a B and an A for number one. Does anyone have uh, any other choice, or or are you all agreeing to either A or B? All right, brothers and sisters, and the correct answer to question number one. When was the entire Quran put into written form? It was the correct answer is number C, 1C, not A or B. It was during the lifetime of the Prophet. Ah, those who say 1A, it was collected together in one place in written form in the lifetime of in the Khilafat Abu Bakr. But it was written all of it in the lifetime of the Prophet. Right? Notice the question didn't say brought together in one place, it just says put into written form the entire Quran because remember there are those who claim the Quran was not written in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. it was after his death that the companions put it in written form no the truth is it was written in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. it just wasn't collected in one place that happened at the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq and the time of Uthman you know again you know something similar happened okay very good question number two why did the Khalifa Uthman decide to do his collection of the Quran? I mean, it was already collected by Abu Bakr Siddiq. Why did he decide to do his own? A, he wanted to leave a great legacy. B, the people of Syria, Sham, and Iraq differed about the recitation of the Quran. So he wanted to unify the Muslim Ummah. C, he had a lot of free time on his hands. So he decided to keep busy. And the D, all of the above. What is the correct answer? Number two, why did Uthman decide to do his own collection of the Quran? It was already collected by Abu Bakr, right? So why did he decide to do it himself? Question number two, type your answers in the chat, brothers and sisters. Gonna give you a few seconds. 2B. All right. We have a 2B. Any other options? 2B. Okay. You all seem to agree, mashallah. Yes. The correct answer is 2B. Because remember, he's the Khalifa. He didn't order it. It was only when he was informed that the people of Syria and Iraq, because you're now in the same army going to jihad together. And they started to hear each other recite Quran. This is when they differed. And when he when he was informed of this, he realized he needed to you to unite the Muslim Ummah. Now, in fact, um, Hudayfa ibn al Yaman, Subhanallah, those were his words: "Unify the affairs of this Ummah, O Khalifa, O Amirul Mu'minin, before they differ about the Book of Allah." Yes. All right. So two. The correct answer is B, number two, B. All right, very good, mashallah. Question number three. The companion Abdullah bin Mas'ud was not part of the effort to compile the Quran during the Khilafah of Uthman. Why? Why? A, Uthman did not like him, so he left him out. B, there were enough competent people to do the collection. So there was no need to get Ibn Mas'ud involved. C, it was an urgent matter, and the Khalifa did not think it was wise to delay the issue since Ibn Mas'ud was in Iraq, and the Khalifa is in Medina, remember that? And D, all of the above. Why was Ibn Mas'ud left out of this effort to compile the, the, the Quran during the Khilafat of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. All right. Type your answers in the in the chat. Question number three. Yep. All right. We have a 3C. Okay. Any other uh, takers? Any other options? Okay. Yes, the correct answer is C, 3C. It was an urgent matter. The Khalifa is in Medina. The matter came to his attention. Ibn Mas'ud is in Iraq. 
it will take a while. 3D, all of the above? No. I'll tell you why it's not all of the above, brothers and sisters. Because A is absolutely false. There is zero evidence, period, that Uthman ibn Affan did not like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, subhanAllah. No, there is no such evidence. The companions loved each other. They might differ with each other, by the way. But differing does not mean they hated each other, no. So D is wrong for the simple fact that A is absolutely not true, right? B is kind of there, right? That's possible. There were surely competent people in Medina to do it. There's no need to get in, Ibn Mas'ud involved. But that's not really why. The real reason is Ibn Mas'ud is in Iraq. The Khalifa is in Medina. The attention came, to, the issue came to his attention in Medina. Now he needs to do something. He thought, look, there is no, you know, I don't have the time to wait for, to send a message to Iraq. Then the guy has to come to Medina. Time is wasting, right? Time is going. He needed to do something ASAP to ensure that the Ummah stays united. So C is the correct answer now. Okay, beautiful. Question number four. I know it's nine o'clock, but I just want to get through two more. Why did Uthman order that all other Quranic materials be burned? Why? Why not keep them, right? Why did he order the companions to destroy their, their own personal copies? All right, so sorry. Here are our choices. A, he wanted to ensure that there were no contradictions in the Quran. B, he was concerned that the next generation would not be able to tell what was Quran and what was the writer's own explanation written in the margins. C, he had his own version of the Quran which he wanted to impose, right? Impose upon the people. So there should be a P here. To impose upon the people and D, none of the above. What is the correct answer? Why did he order that all other Quranic materials be burned? Write the number of the question and the letter to, of the correct answer. 4B. All right, very good. 4B. Any other options? Anyone else? 4B, mashallah. Okay, so there's some agreement there. Any other options? Okay. Yes, the correct answer is B. He was concerned that the next generation will not be able to tell the difference between what is Quran and what the person who wrote this wrote in the margins or above the word or below the word as their own personal explanation. Right. Remember, the writer would have known the difference. If I write something, I will know whether this is Quran and what I wrote above is, is tafsir and so on, right? Or my own personal comments. But if somebody else of my own generation picks this up, he might not be able to tell. Worse yet, if another generation were to pick up this, they will not be able to tell for sure. So subhanAllah, this is why he said, burn all, all, all the copies you guys have. Now come and make a new copy from ours so there are no mix-ups mix-ups and so on right okay very good and quickly our last question when the collection of the quran was done on the order of the khalifa uthman zaid ibn thabit said that he missed the verse from surah al ahzab and that he did not find this verse with anyone except al khuzayma al ansari he said he did not find this verse except with anyone with anyone else except this one companion what did he mean by this statement? He did not find it with anyone except Khuzayma al-Ansari. A. Did he mean that only Khuzayma al-Ansari had memorized the verse? B. Only Khuzayma al-Ansari had the verse in written form? C. Only Khuzayma al-Ansari had memorized as well as written the verse? And D. None of the above. What exactly does this statement mean? That he did not find it with anyone except Khuzayma al Ansari. Yes, number five. Write the number of the question and the letter of the answer. What do you think is the correct answer of the, the meaning of the statement from Zaid ibn Thabit? He said, I missed the verse from Surah Al Ahzab, which I used to hear the Messenger of Allah reciting a lot. And I did not find it with anyone except Khuzayma al-Ansari. All right, we have a 5D, none of the above. Okay, any other choices?
five, number five. Okay. Well, D is not the correct answer. The correct answer is B. When he said the only person he found it with was Hosaima Al Ansari, he meant in written form. Because, and the proof is, brothers and sisters, go back to the hadith, right? You have the handout. Go back to the hadith. He said, I missed the verse, which from Surah Al Ahzab, which I used to hear the Messenger of Allah reciting a lot, which means Zaid ibn Thabit had memorized the verse. So it cannot mean that Khuzayma al Ansari is the only one who had memorized it. No. Many had memorized it. So when he said, I didn't find this verse except with this one companion, it has to mean that it was in written form because everybody else had memorized it. He himself had memorized it. He said, I used to hear the Messenger of Allah reciting a lot, which means he knew the verse. He had memorized it, but he wanted it in written form as well. So the correct answer is B, not C, not A, not D, of course, but B. Only Khuzayma al-Ansari had the verse in written form. Everybody else had memorized it, but nobody else had written it down. Now, yes, Salam. Okay, thank you very much, brothers and sisters. Jazakumullahu khairan. Once again, it's a pleasure to share these thoughts uh, uh, with all of you. May Allah continue to bless all of you. And inshallah, may Allah teach us what is beneficial to us. May He cause us to benefit from what we learn. And may He increase our knowledge so that we can better serve Him and worship Him. No, it's not C. Khuzayma is not the only one who had memorized it only. He is the only one who had it in written form. Many companions had memorized it. Zaid ibn Thabit himself memorized it because he remembered it. And he said, I used to hear the Messenger of Allah reciting this verse, but I couldn't find it with anybody. He knew the verse. If he didn't know the verse or remember it, then, of course, you know, then uh, he wouldn't say it, make that statement. May Allah see you all next week, inshallah, same time, same place. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.